Thank you, Ron. Between the songs that Pastor Jeff picked out and the um, the testimony of Ron, I don't have a lot left to say. <laughs> but that never stopped me before, and it won't this morning. But I'm, uh, if you haven't met me, I'm Richard Maservi, and I serve on the pastoral staff. I, uh, I'll be finishing the series on uh, Life Group because Pastor Sean is traveling this, this week, and um, we didn't want to put this off. I have a, a hate, hate relationship with Facebook. <laughs> But I did, oh no, don't get all the gas. I say worse things than that, Laura. <laughs> but I did post when I rode my truck into the, into the ditch and it was totaled during the hurricane. And uh, I got a lot of responses to it. Most of them very, I'm glad you're okay, glad you didn't get injured, you know, the Lord is good. Uh, uh, Nice things like that. And then there were quite a few snarky comments, which I deserved because my post said, you know, three years ago when my son did the same thing, I thought, oh, how could you be so stupid to run off the road into the ditch and destroy your car? And now I know why. It... <laughs> but there was one comment that stuck with me. And I don't want to mention any names, but she lives where Ron lives. And she said, well, it's not your first rodeo. And I knew exactly what she meant. Because one of my favorite experiences with Life Group is uh, there was a construction problem that they, uh, they broke through a, uh, a gas main near our house. And we had to evacuate for a week. And we stayed at a... a either Airbnb or bread and breakfast or so, something out um, on Holiday, Holiday, Island, Holiday Island. And I was backing the truck out of this um, driveway, which had a curve in it, but I couldn't see that well because I can't see that well at night anymore. And I couldn't see and there weren't any lights. And I drove it into a ditch and I couldn't get it out. But I... I know people in a life group that I thought maybe would serve. So I called, I mean, can't think of a better servant than this. I called C.D. White. He, and he said, happy to come and pull you out, which he did. So, you know, life goes on. But what I didn't realize was that that neighborhood had a Facebook page. Somebody took a picture of the truck and posted, what's the matter with the drunks around here <laughs> that are, they leave their trucks stranded? So the owner of the house called and said, hey, <laughs> what are you doing to our house? And then we explained, it, blah, blah, blah. She said, well, um, I own the house next door. So if you want to turn around in the grass between the houses, you can do that. So the next time I had to go out, that's what I did. Neither one of us had thought that maybe it would be a problem if it had rained for an entire week in North Carolina and the truck got stuck in the mud between these houses and it's only two-wheel drive and I couldn't get it out. So I said, I don't want to call CD again. I'll call Ron Beitzel. <laughs> and sure enough, he came over and towed me out. So fast forward a few years, and I drove off the road. You, you begin to see a path. This is why it's not my first rodeo. You, I drove and totaled the car, and that time another member of our life group, Joe Vate, said, I'm not using my truck. You can keep it as long as you want. And the, the point of this is if you need a truck, join a life group. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have a truck... Join a life group. You, you can be like the guy, uh, a fellow moved into a new neighborhood and he was outside fixing things as you do when you move into a new house and a, a neighbor came by and helped him. And he had a toolbox with all kinds of really high-end good tools, not like the stuff I have in my garage. Good tools that he could use and 
you know, and he helped him out. So the fellow says, really appreciate your help. So what do you make with all these tools? He said, mostly friends. <laughs> and there's a, there is something about meeting in a small group that gives opportunities, as Ron said, to, to serve one another and to serve the Lord together. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 42, if you could turn in your Bibles. If you did take one of the guest Bibles from the back, they're free to keep. It's on page 582, but I'm not reading from that translation today. <laughs> but that, you can follow along, but the words will be slightly different. I'm reading from the New International uh, Version. Isaiah chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory or to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them, let the wilderness and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives, let the people of the Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. There is the hope of the gospel that the Lord would come in order to conquer the curse that is on this fallen world. When Pastor Sean preached last week on Ephesians chapter 4, he reviewed for us the themes of chapters 1, 2, and 3. And I thought I would do the same thing in Isaiah chapter 42, review for us the themes of chapters 1 through 41. And I might as well do 44 through 66 because you want to know where he's going. And that was my thought. But then I had uh, a reason not to. Chili. We want to, we want to get to the chili feast. So uh, I, I'm not going to go through the entire book of Isaiah as much as I know you want me to. And I, I <laughs> yeah, thank you, Laura. <laughs> and I should say, uh, we're focusing on life groups and we have a chili meal. It doesn't mean that you have to sign on the dotted line in order to get the chili meal. You're well, everybody is welcome, whether you're uh, interested or not, and whether you uh, brought chili or not, as Chelsea already said. So we've been looking at life groups and focusing on three areas. Connecting with one another in a way that's deeper than what we can do in, in a, a, a large gathering on Sundays. Uh, growing together uh, in, the, in the things of God in order to become a complete and full people in Christ. And then finally, service to him, as, uh, as the, the testimony already said. And I, I wanted to stress, first of all, 
that uh, as Pastor Sean had said both uh, week one and week two, these are not arbitrary commands that come out of the blue just to do something. They are an expression of the life that we have in Christ. It's who we are and it's who He is in our midst that causes us to long for connections that teach us how to grow in Christ. And we serve because we are in union with the one that God calls my servant. That Isaiah lived in a day of, of darkness and despair. The nation of Israel and Judah were corrupt and were going into exile and judgment. The leaders of those nations were corrupt and leading the nation worse than they were already. And it looks like God's promises won't be fulfilled. But Isaiah sees a day, a day of restoration, a day of healing, a day of grace, a day of new creation. And he specifically says that he will bring justice to the nations. And justice is a word that we talk a lot about today. And uh, the, the, the Hebrew word for justice includes way more than legal dis decisions. But it is essentially the rule of God based on his character, his nature, and his design for his creation. It is the desire to have a society, a civilization, that is based on who God is. That's the completion of justice. And he says he will do it through one that he calls his servant. Now, we've seen this, this servant before in Isaiah. He's the one that Isaiah said they'll call Emmanuel, God with us. He's the one that, that said his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He's the one that we'll read in a few chapters that will not only serve, but will suffer for the sins of his people and for those of the whole world. So that this justice could be completed because the one that's called my servant would come and, pr and promote it. The, the, the commentators debate who this refers to. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, there's no debate. For he said, it is Jesus, the Messiah, that fulfills this text. He is the one that comes as the servant of God, anointed by God, chosen by God, the, the one that God delights in, in order to produce this work of salvation, to open blind eyes, to set people free from captivity, to bring new creation life into a dark and broken world. And we, we are invited to join that life. As, as our scripture read, reader read this morning, that he did not come to be served, though he deserves to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That is, to pay with his life for my sins, for your sins, for our sins, and to, to set us free to serve the living God. But he didn't just serve God when he came. He served people. The expression of serving God was, was found in his service to people. You remember on the night he, he was betrayed, he washed the disciples' feet, and he said, I've left you an example to follow. That as the Son of Man washes your feet, you wash one another's feet. This is why we focus on service. It's not because we need something else on our to-do list. And it's not because we need to earn something with God. For we are lost. He sets us free by the, 
by the sacrifice of his son and by the power of his spirit, he makes us new creations. So we serve because we're in union with the one that is called my servant. We can't help but have a desire to serve when he is in our hearts. And this is why the, the, the people that helped me, uh, C.D. and uh, Ron and Joe, they did it not to gain anything, but because they have servant hearts. And that's our challenge, to have a heart that's like the heart of Jesus. That's, that's why we do what we do. In this church, we, there's a, a motto, you can see it on the website, we say it all the time, that EMC is a Christ-centered community of holy love. Christ-centered. He's the foundation and he's the life of everything that we do. But we're not just individuals, we're a Christ-centered community of people joined together in Christ to express the, the character of Christ in holy love one to another and to the, to the world. Now, I, I, I said I, I serve on the pastoral staff in my title, which is pretty long, is Associate Pastor of Congregational Care. Now, the fact is, it's a pretty easy job. It's a, it's a pretty easy gig because we have a congregation that already cares. It's not a case of manufacturing something that doesn't exist. I, I don't know whether you know it, but you probably do. But th there, there is a group in this church called Stephen Ministers. And they have spent, I mean, they say 50 hours of training, but is way, way more than 50 hours because you have to do reading before you go to the, the groups and then it doesn't stop when you finish and get your license. Well, it's, it's not a license, it's a name tag. <laughs> but, <laughs> it, but those are people that want to serve other people that are going through crisis. And some of them have, have spent an hour a week for years to walk people through. It is not possible for the pastor or a pastoral staff to do congregational care. It requires the members of the body of Christ to care for one another. And we have people that will sacrifice their time and energy just to do that. We have people that you know, as, as we've been stressing the last three weeks, it, it's not enough just to, to uh, see a, a live stream, a, you know, a, a, a TV of, of a congregation. We need personal touch. But there are people, because of illness or whatever reason, cannot join us and have personal touch. But did you know that there's a group of people in this church that go to those people to minister to them throughout the, the year? That there are people that bring the presence of Jesus to people that need a touch from him. And you know what they find? They find that Jesus is in that person as well. And together, they share in the heart of Jesus. There is something, uh, you, you might not even know it, but there is something supernatural that takes place when Christians meet together in fellowship. There is something that the, the world cannot create, but the Lord does in his, in his own power. When I was in, uh, before I retired, I was in a, a company that did medical IT work. And from time to time, we would have a new customer or, you know, a prospective customer, and we'd, you know, try to talk them into buying ours, which was the best. But they would often require a proof of concept. A proof of concept was in their own network and in their hospital 
put our system in to see if it works on a small scale. And if it works on a small scale, then they would sign the contract and it would, we would put it, put it everywhere. The Church of Jesus Christ. This, this church right here is a proof of concept of what Isaiah was talking to. That, that, the, that the coming one, the servant would come. He would bring the fullness of God to the nations. He would bring justice and righteousness, mercy, compassion, the peace of God to the nations. And he would begin it with people like you and me in a, in a small setting like this. That what he is doing in the nations is what he wants to do right here first among us. That this one that came, this one that came as a servant of God, chosen by God, delighted in God, and anointed by the Spirit of God, dwells in our midst in order to do this here. And I want to be a part of that. I, I want to be included in that mission. So I just wanted to look at a, a couple aspects of service. Ron touched on these already, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> the, first of all, we serve one another. When we serve the living God, he lives in us, and we serve one another in the needs that we, we have. But we don't just serve one another, we serve with one another. That there are a, a, a calling of life groups. We, some life groups join in souls to take meals once a quarter to, uh, to uh, uh, people in, in need. So there, there is a team of people that serve together. And what happens when they do is the, the things that we've already talked about are intensified. Because they serve together, they connect in a deeper way. Because they serve together, they grow together. So these, these three things that we focus on, the, uh, the connection, the growth, and the service, are not like individual items that first I connect and then Gradually, I grow and grow and grow and grow, and then eventually I serve and I'm done. No, it's, it, they all three go together. I connect, so I serve. I connect, so I grow. I grow, and that enables me to connect, and it also causes me to serve. I serve, so that makes me connect more and grow more. That all these three things are happening all the time and intensifying, and they're all motivated not because I heard a command, but because Jesus lives in us, and he is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish in his, in his people. So we serve one another. We serve with one another. And eventually, that heart of Jesus overflows the banks of this little pond and goes to, the, goes to the nations. And we'll find some people that will join together to go onto the front lines of spiritual warfare in our world. We don't always recognize, I mean, we... We recognize that things are bad, but we don't recognize that there is a satanic work in our world today, and we are involved in a battle. I, I said on Wednesday night, I'm going to say it again because that's what I do. I was watching a, I don't know what you call it, an adventure series of Jack Ryan, and one of the one of the episodes, there's a, a, a Russian minister of defense that wants to uh, cause a war because he thinks that the leader of the Soviet Union is weak. And if there's a war, he can get rid of him and take his place. And he says his argument was this, detente, that is truce, is not victory. And... You know, he was evil. He was bad. But I thought to myself, 
he's kind of right. That we are in a warfare and we tend to think, if, if Satan doesn't bother me, I won't bother him. And if I don't bother him, he won't bother me. And I'll just go through life, status quo, and not realize that in fact, we are in warfare. And when people, I, I think of this uh, group that have volunteered to go to uh, Mexico, to the darkest part where the gospel has not penetrated, to go and bring the gospel of Christ to people that are in darkness and in bondage, to open their eyes, as it says here, and set them free, they will know what it's like to be in spiritual battle. And they will have to depend on each other. They will connect with each other. They will grow and they will serve one another and with one another in such a manner, I believe, we'll be jealous when they come back. Because there's an opportunity that they will experience that we won't experience. It reminds me of uh, uh, the book by uh, Stephen Ambrose, uh, A Band of Brothers. And they made a series of it. I haven't seen it, so I, I can't recommend it. But in the, in the book, he, he talks about this uh, army company that landed in D-Day and went through the rest of uh, Holland and Germany in, in World War II. But it was the training and working together that shaped them into a company that could stand up when they didn't have uh, even winter clothes and they didn't have uh, 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 enough ammunition and they didn't have food and they didn't have artillery. But they bound together because neither one of them, anyone wanted to let their brothers down that were in that battle. And uh, Ambrose says in his book, that the result of these shared experiences was a closeness unknown to all outsiders. Comrades are closer than friends, closer than brothers. Their relationship is different from that of lovers. Their trust in and knowledge of each other is total. They would literally insist on going hungry for one another, freezing for one another, dying for one another, and the squad would try to protect or bail them out when anyone got into trouble. I think that's a description of the people of God that go forward in his name into a dark world. One of them wrote back, wrote, you know, years later looking back that his, his grandson asked him, uh, Grandpa, were, were you a hero in the war? And he said, no, I wasn't a hero. But I was in a company of heroes. And that's... I think that's life group. Life group, I mean, the thing that I was surprised on, I, I'm used to kind of expert at coasting, right? <laughs> you get to a certain age and say, yeah, I've done my part and just coast on out. And then we move down here and we find people that are not coasting. They're doing prison ministry. They're doing all kinds of ministry. They're, life is not over because we reach a certain, a certain age. And what they did was inspire me to want to be a better Christian. Not to make it another movie hour, but I, there's another movie that I remember, and I'm not recommending you see it because I don't remember how seedy it is. <laughs> Everybody's got a different level of uh, tolerance for Hollywood, so I'm not recommending. Uh, I just remember one scene. And the scene is uh, from the movie As Good As It Gets. And Jack Nicholson is a broken, neurotic, maybe sociopathic jerk. To, that's the technical term. And yet he, has a, he goes on a date with this not neurotic, <laughs> attractive woman. And, uh, you know, first of all, first I thought you had to suspend disbelief. But then I realized I'm in such a marriage where, where you have, you know, a, a together woman that would marry somebody like me. But anyway, they go on a date. And... He, um, 
he's not even trying to hurt her. He's just broken. And he says, I, you know, I can't believe, what a nice restaurant. But, you know, they made, I had to buy new clothes because they required a jacket and tie. I had to buy new clothes, and you could come in that house dress. That is not the way to, <laughs> to, to, to advance on a date. And she was rightly upset and was going to leave. She said, because it wasn't just that. It was all the time. And she said, I, I'm not, I can't take this anymore. I'm, I'm leaving unless you can give me a compliment. I mean, a real compliment that you mean. And he goes into this long-winded story, longer than I'm talking, telling you. And you're thinking, this doesn't even make any sense. It's not a compliment at all. And then eventually he says, you make me want to be a better man. You make me want to be a better man. Do you have people that make you want to be a better man, woman, believer, follower of Jesus? That's what we want. That's the goal of the life group or any small group uh, to to um, connect, to grow, to serve, to be better men, to be better women, to be better believers. Now, we wonder, sometimes you think, you know what? These people are better than I am, and I don't know if I can play on their team. But... That's the beauty of the body of Christ. That he takes broken, neurotic, psychotic people and make them into servants of God, servants of, of Christ. He does it as he says of this servant that came. This is my servant. I uphold him. I strengthen him. I keep him in my grasp. I delight in him. And I put my spirit upon him. In Christ, God says the same thing about us. I have chosen you. I uphold you. I delight myself in you. And I pour out my spirit upon you to make you not just want to be a better man, but I make you a better man. That when Jesus is active in a church, when Jesus is active in a group, when Jesus is active in people, we become like him. And he gives us supernatural gifts to do it. I wondered, sometimes... You wonder if you can actually be effective in, in service. Because you know your inadequacies. You know your brokenness. You know your sin. And, and you know, is that why I don't want to get into a close group? That they might reveal who I, who I am. But I, I would point out what it said here in Isaiah that this one that comes to bring justice to all the nations, this one comes. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice. He doesn't bully, bicker, or bark at his people. He's not the drill sergeant that, that the uh, E Company had to withstand in order to get ready for battle. He, it says, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he has brought forth justice on the earth. A bruised reed, that is a reed that's cracked and bent, cannot support anything. Common sense says get rid of it and get another reed. A, a smoldering wick, it's flickering, but it doesn't give any light it's just smoke. Common sense says get rid of it. Get another wick. 
But not so with this servant. This servant, it says, he, a bruised reed, he will not break. The weak one, the broken one, he heals and strengthens and uses. The, the one that's smoldering, he doesn't snuff it out. Instead, he trims the wick. He replenishes the oil and the light burns. The weakest among us, that does not disqualify us from service. In fact, if you take the word that Paul said, the weak are the ones that God uses to put to shame the powerful. The foolish are the ones that he uses to put to shame the wise. It's the broken one that knows he needs God's grace. If he's ever going to do anything of any value, it has to be the grace of God. That's the one that God can use. That's the one that he calls, chooses, delights, in, and empowers with his spirit in order to, to, to uh, provide the, the grace and justice of God to, to the world. I, I think of... Uh, Simple, simple things that people have done with eternal consequences. We might ask, you know, I, you know, I'm not that smart. I'm not that educated. I'm not that wealthy. I'm not that strong. My personality, I mean, I have a lot of deficits. But that isn't the point. The point is, what do I do with who I am? What do I do with what I have? That's the call on us, not to measure ourselves based on somebody else, but what does God want from me? Simple, small things. I mentioned Jesus washing feet in the upper room. And you remember that upper room? They, they had the Last Supper. They instituted the Lord's Supper that we partake of monthly for 2,000 years. We don't even know the name of the person that owned that room. But he made it available to people to, to learn from the master. Some of you have talked to me about opening your home for a life group. God bless you. It, it may seem like a trivial thing, but it may seem like a lot of work that you're not ready for. But it can have eternal consequences when people meet together in a space in order to minister to, to one another. I, I think of the, uh, Jesus working a miracle of um, turning water into wine. And I, I picture one of the servants going home and his wife saying, so how was the wedding feast? Ah, same old, same old. Pouring water, taking it around. Nothing, nothing, nothing to see here. Or did he say, you won't believe it? I poured water in this jug. I took it to the master of the feast and it was wine. I'm telling you, I was participating in a miracle that Jesus did. And all I did was fill it with water. That's all I could do. And yet he took it and made wine for a celebrating feast. I, I see a, a, a field of people, thousands of them, and they're hungry. And Jesus has what? Five loaves and two fish that a, a young boy gave him. And he multiplies it. But did you ever notice the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all point out Jesus didn't feed the people. He gave it to the disciples to feed the people. And I, again, what did you do today, Peter, with, uh, with Jesus? Ah, you know, he did some miracle we had to lug food around. It wasn't, you know, we didn't really get a lot of honor or anything from it. Or did they say, you wouldn't believe this? Jesus multiplied loaves and fish and we took it and fed these people. And when they were, when they were hungry, we ran out. We would go back and we would get more from Jesus and we would take it to them. And I think that's the definition of ministry. Freely you have received, freely give. We don't do it. He works a miracle and he uses us to give the grace that we have received from him. That's what ministry is all about. It isn't uh, being something special. It's knowing someone special 
and doing what he has already done for us. There's a, I'm not going to mention anybody's age, but if you're old enough, you would remember a song that used to be sung, Just Ordinary People. God uses ordinary people. People like you and me that give their all to Jesus. And little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. That's what we want. People that will give what little they have to the master in order for it to be multiplied. And they might be broken and bruised, but Jesus heals and brightens. That's, that's what Life Group is about. So if Jeff, if you would help us, I'm going to ask you, I know it's uncomfortable, but maybe God is speaking to you. You, you're sensing his call to get involved in some kind of ministry, I, I'm asking you to come forward and stand so that we can pray together. Maybe you know what he wants you to do. Come and say yes. And maybe you don't know. You, you, you suspect you, he wants something, but you don't know what it is. Will you come and say yes, Jesus? Yes, I'll do. And maybe you know what you should do, but you've been struggling because you don't want to do it. Would you come and say yes? Present yourself before him that he would use you to be his servant. And maybe you can't do that because you don't know him at all. Your eyes have not been opened and you haven't been set free. And yet today, something that the Bible has said, challenge your heart. And you hear Jesus calling, would you come and, and say yes?